Hi, I'm Pastor Dwayne Miller. I'm bringing to you a brand new series called Upper Class Christianity. You know the scripture in Deuteronomy 8:18, where the Bible says, I am the Lord who gives you the power to get wealth. That word wealth means more than money. It actually means I have come to make you my upper class so that I may establish my covenant in the earth. God wants you to live in multiplication, increase, abundance, and prosperity. This is your time to come into the fullness of prosperity in your life. Everybody say, I'm the upper crust. God created you to be his upper class, Deuteronomy 8, 18, and you shall remember, read it with me out loud, you ready? And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Now, I made a paraphrase from the Hebrew, and it goes like this, take charge of all your possessions. Everybody say, I own everything I have. It sounds spiritual to say that I don't own anything, it all belongs to God. That's not true. He gave it to you and he put your name on it. You own everything you have. God gave it to you. He doesn't need it. He can't use it in heaven. That stuff you're wearing on your fingers and around your neck. He uses it to pave the streets in heaven. God doesn't need your stuff. But at the same time, he does need your stuff because he doesn't have an ATM machine in heaven. And the only way that the church and the kingdom of God functions on earth is when you finance it. If nobody gives, nothing is done. So take charge of all the possessions the Lord your God has given you for he has given you the supernatural status of being his upper class. The word wealth in Hebrew is best translated out an upper class that actually has authority, wealth, ability, and strength so that through your influence, he can establish his covenant kingdom up on the earth. So ladies and gentlemen, if anything's gonna get done on the earth for God, it's up to you. I said it's up to you. I'm here to tell you today that God wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be rich. He wants you to have prosperity in every area of your life. God wants you to be the upper class. And he doesn't want you to do it so you can be stingy and so that you can have more. He wants you to be that so you can establish his covenant on the earth. And he gets the glory for it. Hallelujah. Most people have a hard time believing that. You know why? Because financially, most of God's children are like the hamster on the wheel. How many of you ever had a hamster when you were a child? Say, I was, I was underprivileged. My father wouldn't let me have one because he said it's a rat. He said, I, I'm trying to keep mice out of my house, not bring them in. And if you don't believe they're a rodent, just let them, don't clean their cage for about three days. And I'm telling you, you'll smell a rat in your house. And a hamster gets on that wheel and he does the same thing every day over and over again, expecting a different result. And you know what that is, right? Insanity. Most of you with your finances are doing the same thing you did last year and the year before and the year before that, and you're expecting a different result, and it is insane. God wants you to get out of the cage. God wants you to be free. How many of you want to be free with your finances? How many of you want to live in financial freedom? Well, I'm going to tell you how to do that today because what I'm about to show you is so biblical that the Jews have been doing it since Abraham. And the last time I checked, as a class of people, they're the most wealthiest class on the earth. 4% of the American population, and they have 40% of the wealth. They produce the majority of the Nobel Prize winners. They produce the majority of scientific research. I'm just telling you right now, as a matter of fact, through uh, Rabbi Landry, they actually have a space program, and they're getting ready now. Israel is getting ready to go to outer space. 4% of the American population. 2% of the world's population, and they operate in 40% of the wealth. How many of you believe what they do and what they are works? Yeah, absolutely. And they're not saved. They don't know Jesus. Many of them are spiritual. Some of them are atheists. But listen to me, because the principle I'm sharing with you today is not, by and large, first and foremost, a biblical principle, howbeit it is biblical, it is actually a principle of creation. 
It is a principle of what God wrote into the laws of creation, and it will work for anybody, even an atheist. Now, an atheist isn't going to get to enjoy it as much, but I promise you what I'm going to share with you works all the time and in every circumstance. I hold in my hand fruit, and God gives us fruit, our life is to bear fruit. We are his fruitfulness. Everything about our life is fruit. Inside of fruit, there is seed. Now, seed guarantees harvest. That's oversimplified, but I'm just telling you, if I eat my fruit and in the process I eat my seed, soon and very soon, I'm gonna starve to death. Because if I don't give the seed back to its purpose and I eat it, I make another purpose out of it and that is called fertilizer. You either sow seed or you eat seed and if you eat seed, you have no harvest. I was raised over in the Delta. They raise rice, soybeans, all kinds of things, primarily rice and soybeans where I'm from. And I have to tell you that if that rice farmer eats all of his rice and has no seed for next year, he's out of business. See, so a principle of creation is this. God gave it to you, and you can do whatever you want to with it, but it'd be wise not to eat your future harvest. But most Christians are eating their seed because they live a life of instant gratification and they're not willing to live according to a plan and a structure and they gotta have it and they gotta have it now and they're 30 and they want everything mom and daddy's got mom and daddy's 60 and they think that they have a right to it and so they get in debt up to their eyeballs and I'm telling you that between taxes and credit cards and debt, most of you have no seed and if you don't have seeds, you have no harvest. Does that make sense? Now this message isn't gonna be hard, it's gonna be hard to listen to, but it's not gonna be hard to understand. The Bible said in Genesis 8, as long as the earth remains, there is seed, time, and harvest. Break that word seed, time down into two words. There is three-dimensional operation of God's kingdom. God's a three-dimensional God. He is Father, Son, Spirit, but He's one God. He made you in His image, body, soul, spirit, but you're one person. And He has operation of His kingdom in three dimensions always, including giving seed, time, and harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. When you sow seed in time, you'll always have a harvest. Listen, that's not rocket science. If you grow a garden, you know you plant the seed, and in time, you get a harvest. You get it all the time, every time, and some Sometimes more and sometimes less, but you always get harvest from sowing seeds. Amen. Three dimensions in giving. Now, this is something the church has not known anything about, but this is what makes the Jews the wealthiest people in the world because they do this. They give three dimensionally, they give first fruits. All right, that's the first thing we're going to talk about first fruits. And the first thing I want you to know about first fruits is that first fruits and tithes are not the same. Most Christians have been taught that first fruits are tithes or that your tenth that you give to God is actually your first fruits. That is not the, there are two totally separate words in the, in the Hebrew Bible in the language. And he tells them specifically in Nehemiah 12, 44, at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse and in the storehouse, you have offerings, first fruits and tithes separated them out. First fruits are not tithes. The second thing I want you to know about first fruits is that When first fruits are given to whatever spiritual authority is over your life, then it absolutely releases something supernatural. First fruits are to be given to the person who preaches or speaks or teaches the Word of God and spiritually has authority over your life. Now, this is where it gets tough because I am the spiritual authority over your life if you're a member of this church, partner with us on television, a partner with us um, online. Listen to me. I've been here 23 years. You know me, and it ain't about the money. It's about you being blessed. And it's tough. Most reason most pastors can't preach this is because you get up and preach this, people say, oh, well, the pastor's saying I need to give to him. I'm not saying it. The Bible says it. I want to show you how the Bible says it in the Old and in the New Testament. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18.3, this is the priest's due 
from the people. Verse four, the first fruits of your grain and your new wine, your oil and the fleece of your sheep, you give to who? To the priest. When you give to Ruma, I'll get to that word in a moment. When you give first fruits, that Hebrew word for first fruits is to Ruma, you give it to the spiritual authority that feeds you the word of God. That is established right there in Deuteronomy 18. Now, when you give it, first fruits guarantees you have increase in your life, Nehemiah 10, 35. We cast lots among the priests. They're appointed year by year, verse 36, and bring the first fruits of our ground, the first fruits of our tree, into the house of the Lord, to verse 37, the priest that ministers in the house of God. In the Jewish worship, there is the heave offering, the oblation offering, the bread offering, the wave offering. They got all these offerings, and they're all tied with one common Hebrew term, and that is teruma. Teruma is translated out first fruits. Here's the deal. This is why you ought to get excited about this principle. When you give first fruits to the man of God who is in authority over your spiritual life, it guarantees increase is coming. It guarantees, it puts a demand on God's authority because the process of first fruits is when I submit to God's authority and I sow into that authority, then God is required to finish the harvest. The first fruits is the very first part of your harvest and you sow that into God's authority and then God is required to bring increase into your life. Let me say it like this, Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord, Adonai, with your wealth and with the first fruits of your income, then your granaries will be filled and your vats will overflow. Taruma first fruits is the first portion that comes off of the wheat field, the barley field, the fruit tree. You're bringing the first of your animals, giving it to the authority, and I'm telling you, that gives God then the right to make your harvest a bumper crop. Now folks, I've been living this for five years. This works. I have been practicing Taruma and first fruits giving to Rabbi Landry, Ron Phillips, Dr. Ron Phillips, and Dr. Happy Caldwell, the three authorities, apostles over this church and over my life. I've been sowing Taruma into them for five years. I'm telling you, that my income has absolutely quadrupled and then some. You might not be excited about that. I'm pretty happy about it. <laughs> Everything in my life is experiencing exponential increase. I'm just saying, I'm telling you. And why is God doing it? He's doing it because I'm obeying his word. I promise you today that I could introduce you to people. I could introduce you to people sitting right here today. Uh, I could introduce you to all three of my children who are grown. They've all been practicing this and in their life is continual perpetual increase. A daughter and son-in-law were in the first service. They had to go uh, visit his grandmother for her birthday. I have 28, a 28 year old daughter, a 30 year old son-in-law who have been, listen to me, they have been giving between 25 and 30% of their income for the last five years. They got a child, one on the way. Listen to me, they've been giving between 25 and 30% of their income for the last five years. And she's the youngest assist, assistant principal in the state of Arkansas. Got a huge raise last year. He got a new job, promotions, so forth live in a neighborhood they shouldn't live in, in a house they shouldn't have, drive a car they shouldn't be able to afford. I'm, I'm telling you, listen to me, it works. I've got another son. Now we're talking about school teacher salaries. I got another son that's a school teacher and a coach. You know they don't make no money. Been practicing this, constant promote. Listen, they never have to pray and ask God for a better job because they obey God and they're giving the better job finds them. Promotion comes from the Lord. Do you understand? If you have to try to make something happen in your life, you've missed it. You ought to walk in such obedience and giving that prosperity runs you down and runs you over and you, can't, you don't know what to do with all of it. My youngest son and his wife, I'm talking about these are 27-year-old kids. And it's a, it's blow your mind at how blessed they are financially. You know why? Because they give radically. 
They give radically. I've been sowing 30% of my income for five years. It works. It works. A true Jewish Orthodox believer will sow between 35 and 50% of everything they have. I'm just telling you, that's why they're rich. You know why? Because they understand that first fruits guarantees perpetual increase. If you sow into an authority over your life, it puts a demand on God that you must get a harvest or God's word's not true. Are y'all okay out there? I'm trying to help you today. I want you to be rich, blessed, prosperous. When I give my first fruits offering to God's authority, it sanctifies everything else in my life. For the Bible said in Romans eleven sixteen, 16, if the first fruit is holy, the whole lump is holy. You want everything in your life to be blessed by God? Do you want everything in your life, your business, your, your finances, your health, your family, everything in your life is blessed when you put God first. Number five, first fruits as a practice was carried over into the New Testament. How do, how do we know this is a New Testament principle? Galatians 6, 6, whoever's being instructed in the word should share all good things he has with his instructor. 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. What is he saying here? This really don't sit well with religious folks, but here it is. Every pastor in America should make twice as much money as the richest person in America. I knew I wouldn't get an amen there, but I'll amen that myself. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I just don't know. I just don't believe pastors ought to have all that. Well, it's not your business. It's God's. Whoever the richest person is in this church, I should be worth twice as much as you. He's worthy of double. That's what the Bible said. I didn't write the book, folks. I'm just reading it to you. Well, why, why is that? Let me ask you a question. We pay a guy $300 million over 10 years to hit a little white ball over a 400 foot fence. Amen. And I, I love sports, I love sports. But we, we, we had a guy sign a $300 million contract on a losing team, never win anything, 300 million to hit. He fails seven out of 10 times and he gets $300 million to try to hit that ball. Something wrong with that pitcher. So how is Taruma determined, Pastor? If I'm supposed to pay Taruma into the authority over my life, what's that look like? In the Hebrew, there's a term called the bickering, and the priest would go out into the field or into the orchard when the crop would first bud or bloom or the head would come up on the wheat or the barley. I was raised over in the Delta, so, you know, in the spring when that wheat field would begin to put on a head of wheat. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've seen, well, when it would first start and you first noticed the head, the, the wheat heading out, or if you had an orchard and the blossoms come, Two people this morning said that their pear trees were already blooming. That's not good because there's going to be more cold weather. But nonetheless, when the crop begins to bloom or head, the priest would go out and he would watch this. He's the authority now from God and he goes out into the land. It belongs to you. And he says, your Taruma is between 140th, 160th of this crop and it's determined by how your crop is heading out. If you're gonna have a bumper crop, then 1 40th of what you take in is mine. And then it guarantees that what I just said happens in your life. Why? Because you shook my hand and said 1 40th this, of this crop belongs to the man of God and it demands that God bring a harvest. Otherwise, if the crop fails, the man of God fails, you fail and it doesn't work. Some of you have got crop failure in your life because you don't sow. Some of you are riding around in your harvest when it really should have been sown and given to God and then you'd get to ride around in something that wouldn't break down every other week. You're preaching good, pastor. I'm telling you, I need something to change in my life. Financially glad, I'm glad you're here today. Taruma guarantees perpetual harvest in your life. Now that's the hardest thing I've got to preach this morning because here's the deal. You want to have a guaranteed perpetual harvest? What does 1 40th and 1 60th look like? It's either a dollar and 60 cents to $2 and 50 cents on a hundred. 
A dollar and sixty cents out of every hundred you make, or two hundred two dollars and fifty cents is going to really break you, isn't it? But that's truma. You see that small little portion given to the th- the authority in your life guarantees perpetual harvest. Period. Guarantees it. I've been living it. That's Taruma. That's Taruma. Many of you are partners with Dwayne Miller Ministries. You've been doing this. I'm telling you, I know who you are. And I'm telling you, I watch God bless the daylights out of you. I just see God blessing people, blessing people. Look, Pastor Chester, sit down here. I'm telling you, he's been doing this for years. And God's blessed him with a, a, a nicer home, a better home, the desire of his heart. But listen, God wants you to have the desires of your heart. If you, if you want to live in a nice place and you want to have a nice house and you want to drive a great car and you want to have a good job, and you, God wants that for you. But if you're eating your seed, he can't do it. And I tell you, the more I get blessed, the more jealous some people get. People, there's a lot of people, they don't mind giving to you whenever you're in poverty and down and out because they do it as an act of feeling sorry for you. And then my dad always told me, he said, if you're financially ever, if you ever come up above the people in your church, some people are going to despise you for it. We ought not despise. The more God blesses me, you ought to get excited because blessings flow from the head down. Whatever God's doing in my life is coming into you. Hallelujah. And by the way, Pastor Chester is not the only staff member that does this. They all do. So, uh, listen. Now let's talk about tithes. Everybody take a deep breath. Whew. It's like a dose of medicine today, isn't it? Man. I got some bad news for you. It's good news, bad news. But in the Bible, there are three tithes. Three. Some of you can't do one, but there are three. Watch how God works. There are three tithes in the Bible. Malachi 3, 8, God said, can a person rob God? Can a person rob God? I was listening to Robert Morris last Sunday as we were in Little Rock uh, taking a day off after our conference, and then we um, went and visited a new church start in Little Rock. But I, was, I never turned the TV on Sunday, but I just happened to be in the hotel, and I flipped it on. Here's Robert Morris, pastor of this great big church gateway out in Dallas, great man of God, great work of God. And um, I heard him talking about giving. I got excited. And he said, when you tithe, you haven't given anything. You've only returned to the Lord what's his. And if you don't tithe, you're a thief. He said that. I thought, boy, that's not a seeker-friendly church, is it? (laughs) When you tithe, you haven't given a thing. As a matter of fact, you can't even sow seed until you're a taruma giver and a tither. I'll get to that in a moment. You hadn't even put any seed in the ground yet. The first tithe belongs to the Lord. He said, how have, you, how have you robbed me? He said, in tenths, tithes, and voluntary contributions. Now, I would come and say to you, in my opinion, this tithe thing is non-negotiable. The teruma, the seed offerings, I think those are voluntary offerings. Those determine how, how much you won't be blessed. But the tithe thing's a whole different ballgame. When you tithe, give one-tenth of everything you have to the Lord's church, you've just given God what's His. You haven't done anything. The tithe and tithes are not the same thing. In the Bible, there are three tithes. The Lord's tithe, that word in Hebrew is masher rashon, and it is the tithe that belongs to the God's house. And then the second tithe is pronounced masher shanai. And that is the tithe you pay to yourself. God wants you to tithe to the church and then save 10% for you. That's how the Jewish people leave an inheritance so big that their children and their children's children could live on it if necessary. That's a pretty doggone good inheritance. Think about it. I've got three children. I have two grandchildren. One will be born in a month. One's already got all that I have. But now watch. Whatever my income for a lifetime would be, you think about it. In my 20s, if I lived on that income for the rest of my life, it wouldn't have been all that much. In my 30s, it got a little better. In my 40s, it's real good. You think about if I'd saved 10% of everything I've ever made where would I be today? 
How many of you, if you saved 10% of everything that's ever come through your hands, where would you be today? 50 and retired, right? They save at least 10%, at least. And when they die, there's enough there, in my case, for five families to live at my level for the rest of their life. That's supernatural. If my three children and their spouses and my two grandchildren could live on my annual income for the rest of their lives, hey, that's a lot of money. That's what God wants for you. I want to get that through you. That's what God wants for every person sitting in here today. When you leave this earth, for you to leave behind enough money for everybody in your family to live at your level for the rest of their life. I'm excited about that. You guys are just sitting there like. So it's the Lord's tithe. It's the the, uh, second tithe, your tithe. And then thirdly, the third tithe in Hebrews pronounced Masir Anai. And that is what we would call in the New Testament alms to the poor. Whatever amount you would save for yourself per month, every third month or four times a year, you would sow that amount into ministries that help the poor. And I get excited about helping the poor. Why? Because my Bible says when you take care of the poor, you lend to the Lord. And God's interest rate is unreal. How many of you know God can pay better interest than Wall Street or your bank or the bonds of the U.S. government? If you help the poor, you're lending to the Lord and He will repay you. This is Pastor Dwayne Miller once again thanking you for joining us on our broadcast today. I pray the Holy Spirit has truly touched your heart and life. And not only the Holy Spirit, but I want to tell you that Debbie and I, we want to pray for you. If you have a prayer need, please send it to us at DwayneMiller.com. I personally read every prayer request. I personally respond to every prayer request. Debbie and I pray over every need. We want to touch your life through the power of prayer. So please email us your prayer request today at DwayneMiller.com. And thank you for joining us on today's broadcast. You know, 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things, even as your soul prospers. You know, the biblical term prosperity simply means a good journey. Do you know that it's God's will for you that you have a good journey in life every day? That your day be filled with prosperity and favor and peace, love and joy. God is not angry. God is not upset with you. God has promised prosperity and blessing for you. Would you send us your prayer request at DwayneMiller.com? Debbie and I will personally pray for that need every week. We know that God has set you up for blessing, not cursing, favor and prosperity. Let us agree with you in prayer for those things in your life that you need a miracle in because we know that God, he still is in the miracle business. So send your prayer request to DwayneMiller.com.